Hallelujah. Everybody lift your hands. Father, we thank you, God, that you are in this place. And God, we are asking you to touch us today. Every person that's here that has a need, may they be touched by your presence today. May they encounter the God that loves them. And we give you praise, God, because you are doing something in our midst. And we praise you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. Amen. You may be seated this morning. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you. Grab your Bible with me this morning and turn to the book of Titus. Hallelujah. How many are thankful for the presence of God? Amen. If you don't feel something in this room right now, you've got to be dead. Man, I can just feel. How many just can feel his presence? Amen. Nothing makes me thankful um, or as appreciative of the presence of God as being in a church where the presence of God isn't there. And so I'm always thankful when, when I feel the presence of God. And I've been, I've been in those churches where they ask you to leave because your hand was raised or because your voice was lifted. I've been in those churches. I didn't go back. But I, I just want you to know that if you're here, there's somebody, well, I don't want to be out of order. Listen, you have to do a lot to get out of order because what is out of order is sulking and gossip and backbiting and complaining. But what is in order is expressing our love to him. Amen. And so, uh, you know, don't, don't worry. Somebody said, oh, I'm worried about wildfire. I'm more worried about no fire. Come on, somebody. Do you have Titus? Titus chapter 2. Uh, we are talking about rebuilding the foundation with the cornerstone of hope. This is part 3 today. Titus chapter 2 and verse 11, if you have it, say amen. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared unto all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly desires, we should live soberly, righteously, and in godliness in this present world. If it was true 2,000 years ago, how much more is that true today? Verse 13, as we await the blessed hope or the blessed hope, And the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all lawlessness and purity for and purify for himself a special people zealous of good works. The cornerstone of hope, part three, the blessed hope or our blessed hope. Judah's really been frustrated with me saying blessed so but we're just going to call it the blessed hope because that's what I heard when I was a kid amen say our blessed hope we've been talking about the cornerstone of hope Uh, we've been talking about the the importance of understanding what hope is hope obviously is the vehicle in which our faith operates it is not the absence of faith it is the result of faith hope is the expression of our expectation Because the battlefield of faith is won or lost in the arena of our expectation. Amen. Hope, uh, we talked about, is four things. Hope is unabandoned trust in Him. It is confidence in Him. It is expectation, anticipation. And hope causes us to move forward. Amen. Last week we talked about kingdom hope. Kingdom hope brings us eight things. New life, healing, blessing empowerment, peace, joy, victory, and new beginnings. How many are thankful for new beginnings? Amen. I say, I got, I've got hope. I've got kingdom hope. Amen. The times that we're living in are unprecedented times. Many are living lives of discouragement, despair, and distress. We're living in a time that nobody prepared us for. We're living in a time... Uh, that we uh, have never, the Bible says, you've not yet walked this way before. And while that was written in, in talking about the promises of God and the future in God, we can also say in 2020, we've never walked this way before. 
And many are living their lives in this time in panic and fear and frustration and discouragement and distress. And many are living their lives in depression. And it's because, I believe, it is because their gaze is on what is happening in the earth. And they've forgotten, as the old folks used to sing, to turn your eyes upon Jesus. We, 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 we are living in a time where people are full of anxiety and full of stress and full of pressure, and they're burdened down. So I believe it's time for us to return back to the basic things. It's time for us to go back to the cross. It's time for us to turn our eyes unto Jesus. It's time for us to realize, and I'm jumping ahead so y'all forgive me, but it's time that we realize that what is happening around us is not as great as what is happening inside of us. It's time for us to return to the cross. It's time for us to return to Bible basics. That there is still a God alive who sits on the throne. That Jesus is alive at the right hand of the Father, ever making intercession for you and for me. And that we've got to stop getting our eyes on what's happening politically. On what's happening uh, in, in our nation financially. To stop focusing so much on a pandemic and start focusing on the power and the presence of an almighty God who loves us and offers us hope. We are a house of redemption, restoration, and relationship. We are not a house of panic. We are not a house of discouragement. We are not a house of distress. We are a house of redemption. God is the God that redeems. God is the God that restores. And it is He that we have a relationship with. So I want us to remind us, number one, that God is the God of hope. God is the God of hope. Your Bible says in the beginning, God. Now, if you can't get past that, you don't get anything else in the Bible. Because right there, in the very first verse of the Bible, he forces you to have a life of faith. Because God, you have to understand, why do you have hope, Pastor? I have hope because my God will never have an ending because he never had a beginning. My God is eternal. Nobody can take him out because nobody gave him a start. Right? In the beginning, God, he is, he always has been, and he always will be. And it is that God that offers hope. We've got to understand that the gospel is a gospel of hope. In the beginning, God created man to have dominion in the earth, and to have relationship with him. And then man fell in the Garden of Eden, and sin entered the picture. And then God had to come up with a plan to offer hope to lost humanity, to offer hope to the created beings that he had in the earth that were never intended to die. He did not create Adam so that Adam would eventually die. The Bible says that death is the result of sin. Had they, not, had they not disobeyed God, man would not even know what death is. In the beginning, God, and he created man. So then God had to have what I call the gospel of hope. The gospel of hope begins with the conception of Jesus. At his conception, Jesus was sent to this world to give hope. That is why we have Christmas. It's not the big fat guy in the red suit. It's because of the little baby that was born in a manger. Come on, somebody. That when, he was con when she conceived and Jesus came into the womb of a very person he created. When he took down, when he sat down off of his glory and took on the form of flesh and became a baby, and that little teenage girl became pregnant and she was still a virgin. But at that moment, she was not just pregnant with a baby. She was pregnant with the gospel of hope. Come on, say amen. And then we see as he grew to be about 30 years of age, we see that Jesus uh, uh, had a crusade of miracles. His crusade of miracles was simply him extending hope to hurting humanity. Everywhere he went. Why do I say this is a gospel of hope? Because this same Jesus that we're talking about is the same one that could not attend a funeral. 
The Bible says that, that a funeral procession was going by where Jesus was. And right in the middle of it, that old boy sat up and got resurrected just because Jesus was near. Are you here? That's the gospel of hope I'm talking about. That every, every time he healed the blind, healed the deaf, rose the dead, he was offering hope to hurting humanity. To the woman with the issue of blood that had suffered for 12 years, he gave her hope. To Lazarus who was dead four days, he gave hope to him and his family. Whenever he came encountered with hurt and pain and suffering, hope is what he offered. Then we get on to... What didn't look very hopeful, the crucifixion. But in the crucifixion, Jesus was paying the price for our hope. Hanging on a cross with spikes driven into his hands and his feet and a crown of thorns on his head. With 39 stripes on his back, he looked like the picture of misery. He looked like the picture of pain and suffering. And your Bible says that he was rejected by men, but he was also smitten by God. But he wasn't losing. He was paying the price for our hope. See, on Friday night, on Friday night, Shunda, on Friday night, hell thought that they were the ones that had won the victory. But they have to understand something. You can't get resurrected if you don't ever die. He paid the price. For our hope. And then that first Easter Sunday morning, that stone was rolled away. And the Bible says, and he that was dead got up. They came running to the tomb that first Sunday morning. That first Easter Sunday morning. They came running to the tomb because they'd heard a couple of ladies say, he's not dead. He's risen. He said, why do you seek the living among the dead? He's not here, but he's alive as he said. So Peter and John said, well, before I believe you, I got to go see it for myself. So they had a cross-country race from the house all the way to the tomb. And they ran in there. John stopped at the edge of the grave. But Peter, both Old Peter ran into the grave and they didn't find the body of Christ. They found a napkin folded and put off into the corner because he was not dead. He arose speaking hope. He risked hope while he was resurrected but not yet ascended. He appeared before Mary Magdalene and she was crying. She thought he was the gardener. But he said, I'm not the gardener. I'm, it's me. It's me. Turn around. It's me. I'm alive. And she went to touch him and he said, don't touch me. I haven't put the blood on the mercy seat yet. But when I get there, rest assured, I'm coming back because I'm giving hope to humanity. But the story doesn't stop on Easter, does it? Because the Bible says that not only does he have a resurrection, but he has a return. He's coming back. He is coming back. He ascended. Jesus offered hope of heaven when he ascended. He got up, we like to say. And it was all for hope. Acts chapter 1, verse 10 and 11. While they looked intently toward heaven and as he ascended, suddenly two men stood by them in white garments. They said, men of Galilee, why stand you looking towards heaven? This same Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will come in like manner as you saw him go to heaven. The Bible says that this same Jesus, not a different Jesus, this same Jesus, will so come in like manner. As they saw him ascend, there's coming a time when he's coming back. We have to understand the difference when he came the first time and when he's coming the next time. The first time he came as a baby, but he's coming back as a king. First time he came as a lamb, born in a manger. That's where a lamb ought to be born, in a barn, not in a hotel, not in a hospital. But a lamb ought to be born in a barn, so that's why Jesus was born in the barn. First time he came as the meek and mild lamb of God. But the next time he comes, he's coming as a roaring lion. Are you here? The Bible says, why do you seek for the living among the dead? And why do you stand here gazing, wondering where he just went? He just went to where he told you he was going to. And, but they said, but there is a time coming when this same Jesus that just ascended will descend. And he will come back in like manner. I'm here to tell you that he is coming back. 
Not as a baby, not as, not as, not as, as the one movie says, an eight pound, six pounds, you know, baby in his golden diapers. That's not what we're talking about here. We are talking about he's coming back, the Bible says, with a sword in his mouth. He's coming back with a tattoo on his thigh that says King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He's coming back on a white horse. On a white horse. I'm going to be riding on the back of that thing. He's going to turn around and say, Mark, get off. Get your own. <laughs> Amen. How many want Jesus to come back? Jesus said in John chapter 14, Let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I am going to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. You know where I'm going, and you know the way. He said that in his father's house were many mansions, but he says, but I'm going to prepare the place for you. Heaven does not, uh, is not granted to good people. I had this conversation with my kids last night. I said, what's better, to be a good person without Christ or to have Christ and act like you don't know how to be a good person? And my daughter said, but that would never be because if you're a Christian, you ought to be a good person. I said, yeah, you'd think so. <laughs> you don't go to heaven because you're a good person. You don't go to heaven because you give X amount of dollars to good deeds. You do not go to heaven because you never lie, you never steal, you never kill, you never cheat, you never long for your neighbor's wife or his house or his toys. You go to heaven because the Bible says heaven is a prepared place for prepared people. If you are not, if you are not prepared in your heart, and in your soul for heaven, you will not make heaven your home. But Jesus said, but I'm going to prepare a place for you that where I am, you may be also. And where I go, you know where I go. But I will come again. Heaven is a prepared place for a prepared people. Are we prepared for what is prepared? I go to prepare a place. And then he says, and I will come again. Heaven is a place of great reunion. Uh, one of the things I'm looking forward to is I want to sit down and I want to talk to people who walk this earth with Jesus. I want to ask Peter, what were you thinking when you cut the man's ear off? And then Jesus stooped down and picked it up and put it back on his head and said, get thee behind me, Satan. I want to talk to Paul. What was it like to get off, knocked off your high horse and be blinded and then receive your sight again? What was it like to preach to Jews that rejected you, but the Gentiles received you, and everybody said you shouldn't be doing that, but you did it anyway? I want to talk to Daniel. How crazy was it in the den? Hungry lions turned into pussycats. What was that like? What was it like to pray three times a day and everybody tell you you're crazy and you're the reason that laws were made? I want to talk to Abraham. I want to ask him, why did, you, why did you tell everybody your wife was your sister? What were you thinking when God said, get up out of my father's house and go to a place I'll show you after you leave? I want to talk to Adam. What was it like when you woke up for the first time and God breathed into your nostrils and you became a living soul? And then what were you thinking when you met Eve? I want to know the answer to that question. I want to talk to Eve. Was it really an apple? <laughs> All right. Heaven's a place of greatness, but I just don't want to talk to my heroes. I also I got some fam I got some family there. Heaven's a place of great reunion. In heaven this morning are, are, are all four of my grandparents. Actually, five, because uh, my father's father died when my dad was 13. I've never met him. And then my grandmother married a guy that I knew to be my grandfather, and I miss him, and I want to talk to him again. He was very funny. He was six foot four, but tell you he was five foot 16. Very funny. I want to see my grandma and my grandfather again. My little four foot eleven nanny. I want to see her. 
And I, and I, you know, I just want to ask him, we go into the kitchen, she make them cinnamon donuts that she used to make, because you know, I'm, you know, we can eat them and not pay the price for them in heaven. And, and I want to see some friends, and I want to see some other family members. I, I want to see, I want to see my Uncle Odie, that was, that was a sinner his whole life, and then after, after many, many years, he discovered he had lung cancer because of how much he smoked his whole life. And sitting right there in the hospital, he gave his heart to God because he thought he was going to die. And then just a little while later, God not only saved his soul, but he healed his body and took the cancer out of his lungs, and he lived even more. I, I, I want to see my Uncle Odie again, right? But can I tell you something? That if none of the Bible characters are there, and my grandma and my grandpa ain't there, and my Uncle Odie ain't there, and yes, I believe my, my, my dog Brutus is there. He's going to be waiting for me in my mansion. But if none of them are there, but Jesus is, that's the reunion I want to see. I want to fall at his feet. I want to cry on his feet. I want to thank him for everything that he's done for me. I want to take the crown off my head and cast it at his feet. I want to see what the Holy Ghost looks like. I want to see the Father that no man has seen and lived. Because a heaven is a place of great reunion, and I'm going there. The Bible says in Titus that, that this is our blessed hope. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 Verse 51 through 58 says this. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trump will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible will put on incorruption, and this mortal will put on immortality. And when this corruptible will have put on incorruption, and this mortal will have put on immortality, then the saying that is written will come to pass, death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, grave, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 and 17. The Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we forever be with the Lord. I'm here to tell you that we have hope. We have the hope of His return. The Bible says that it's a mystery, but everybody ain't going to fall asleep. Some of us are going to be like Enoch. We were, and then we weren't. That's what your Bible says. That we shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye. We'll be changed. The Bible says the trumpet's going to sound. And when that trumpet sounds, we're getting up out of here. And my favorite part, the Bible says the dead shall rise first. I've always asked God, why do the Baptists get to go first? That's just a joke. Just smile. It's okay. The dead in Christ shall rise first. Every loved one we have will rise first out their grave. Can you imagine? And let me tell you something, whether you are burned in a stove and cremated, or whether you are slapped in a box and buried six feet under the ground, you will get back up again. Can you imagine being that old boy out on his little bass boat in the middle of the lake somewhere, and the trumpet sounds, and he ain't right, and the trumpet sounds, And all of a sudden, the water, the Bible says, the water will give up their dead. That's what your Bible says. It doesn't matter if you're sprinkled all over the sea or not. When the trumpet sounds, your ashes are going to come back together and you will get resurrected. Can you imagine being a gardener out at the cemetery and you don't know the Lord? And the trumpet sounds and whoo! At the grave, come all them folks. That's where I want to be. 
Uh, my pastor says this, I want to grab a sinner by the nap of the neck when the trumpet sounds, take him up halfway, and then say, do you want to get saved now? <laughs> Can you imagine what it will be like when that trumpet sounds? But I'm here to tell you, that if you're not in the grave and you're still alive, that's what the Bible says. We shall not all sleep. We're going to be changed. The Bible says the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together. And we will meet the Lord in the air. Somebody said, well, nobody's going to know it when the rapture takes place. Nobody's going to know when the media's going to try all this stuff. No, the Bible says the Lord himself will descend with a shout. They're going to see it, I believe. They're going to see it. And they're going to dismiss it. They're going to dismiss it. It's them cell phones. It's those satellites. Aliens have stolen your people's bodies, you know? But it's not. But li and listen, I really don't care what they're going to say. You know why? I ain't going to be here. What about the Antichrist, Pastor? I don't intend to meet him. And I'm not here to try to get into a debate whether I am pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib, or no-trib. I'm going to tell you this. When the trumpet sounds, Tim Mars out of here. We fight so much about when that we're not preparing ourselves for the what. We shall not all sleep. We, everybody ain't going to die. So We're going to get raptured. There's no such thing as rapture. Rapture is not in the Bible. Just because the word isn't doesn't mean the event is not. What if you're wrong? I don't lose. What if you are? Let that sink into your heart for a second. What if you're wrong and there's no rapture? What if I'm right and you're wrong? It's not worth fighting over because the point of the discussion is not the rapture. The point of the discussion is preparation. To be right. To be right. Look at somebody and say, you better get right. <laughs> I have the hope of his return. The Bible says he'll descend with a shout. The dead in Christ will rise first, and we'll be caught up together. Uh, uh, uh. Pastor, why are you talking about this? Because the Bible says it's our blessed hope. What does that mean? This ain't it. I started by telling you about these times that we're living in and how people are discouraged and depressed and distressed and frustrated and anxious and fearful and panicking. And it's because they think this is life. This is not it. There's something waiting that is greater than what we are in now. It's a prepared place for prepared people, and it doesn't matter. Listen, don't get distracted because, because we may not all think the rapture is going to take place at the same time, and for goodness sake, quit trying to predict it. 88 reasons. It's come back in 88. Funny, it's 2020. He still ain't come back. So quit trying to do that. Because I guarantee you this, if Jesus himself doesn't know, no prophet will know. Come on, somebody. It's a prepared place for prepared people. I have hope of his return. This is not the end of the story. This is not the end of the story. If someone that we love passes away, that's not the end of their story. It's not the end. It's not the end. It's not the end. And your Bible says that when you get there, you will put on a glorified body. Do you know what that means? There's no old age in heaven. There's no heart trouble. There's no kidney disease. There's no diabetes. There's no addiction. Because you're going to put on a glorified body. How old will I be? I don't know. It isn't worth thinking about. I just know I'm not going to be in this body. I'm going to have a glorified body. What are we going to look like? I don't know. Your Bible says you'll be known as you are known. But we're also said that we're made in His likeness. In His image. Can you imagine? 
And somebody said, well, I don't believe in the rapture. I'm going to stay here to the end of the tribulation, and then I'll go to heaven. Okay, you do that. What are you going to do? I'm going to sit down and eat your dinner at the marriage supper of the Lamb. Why would I fight an antichrist when I can sit down at the table of God and have a buffet for seven years and not gain a pound? And I want to see it. I want to go to heaven. I want to see those gates with pearl. I want to see the colors. I want to walk on streets of gold. That the Bible says in the original that they are not made from gold. They are gold. So pure, they're transparent. You can see through them. I want to see it. I want to see the angels, the cherubim and the seraphim. I want to see heaven's choir. I want to go hang out with David. I want to play the drums while he's playing his guitar. I want to hang out with David, and I want to do all these things. But can I tell you something? Uh, there, there's going to be sights you can't even imagine. The Bible refers to a crystal sea. A crystal sea. Pastor, why is that there? I don't know. Maybe we'll catch glass bass. I don't know. But it's there. It's there. I want to go golfing with God. Oh, you're being silly now. Maybe. Maybe. But if there is a possibility to golf, I want God on my foursome. I'm just saying that. You know what I want? I want God, me, Moses, and Daniel. God, because he'll hold one every shot. Moses, because if there's a water hazard, it will come dry land and go right through. Okay, all right. Okay. <laughs> This is not the end of the story, folks. Why, why am I telling you this? Because you need this kind of hope and not pay attention to what's happening in the world. Be aware, but don't focus on what's happening in the world. Well, we're all going to hell if Trump don't win. Foolishness. I'm going to heaven. I don't care who wins. This is not the end. This is not there's something better coming. There was a woman on her deathbed. Her family's standing around crying at her bedside, saying goodbye. And they were asking her, what songs do you want sung? So she gave them a list. They asked her, who, who do you want the preacher to be? So she told them who. Is there anything you want specific? So she told them. And at the end, with everybody crying because they realized that she's about to leave this world, they asked her, Grandma, is there anything else? Have we missed anything else? And she said, yeah, just one thing. I need something in my casket. And they said, well, something in your casket? Why do you need something? She's like, she goes, put me in whatever dress you want to put me in. Do my hair however you want to do. She's like, I don't intend on being there. This is for you. She said, but the one thing I must have in my casket is I want you to put a fork in my hand. And she said, they said, Grandma, a fork? Why a fork? She's like, well, I've been in church my whole life. My whole life I've been in church. And we always have these fellowship dinners. And I remember when they would come to the table and clear off the plates, they would always say the same thing. Hold your fork. Hold your fork. But I'm full. I'm finished. Why should I hold my fork? Because it's dessert time now. She's like, so I want a fork in my hand, in my casket, because I want everybody to know that while I'm finished with this, there's something better coming. Hold your fork. Hold your fork. Hold your fork. Because there's something better coming coming i don't care what it is that you're going through today I don't, I don't care how bad it is or how grievous it seems to be there is something greater coming and that is my hope that is my hope you know get get through the mixed vegetables of life get through the brussels sprouts get through the broccoli get through the green beans get through the tomatoes Get through the bean sprouts. Bean sprouts. 
That's like the dietary version of a cat having a hairball. <laughs> Get through that mess. <laughs> Get through it. <clears throat> All right. Get through that mess. Get through the liver and onions that my mama used to eat. Get through that. Get through the chicken. Get through, get through the fish. Get through all that stuff. Get, get through your sweet tea. Get through your Coke Zero. Get through your glass of water. But hold your fork. Because there's something better coming. I always wondered when I was a kid when we had fellowship dinners why we, they couldn't be in reverse. Everybody just wants a dessert table anyway. Isn't that right? See, the reality is, when you know what God has prepared for you, everybody wants to get there. But sometimes we miss the opportunities here. So I want to say, as we close today, it doesn't matter what's been happening here. It just doesn't. It doesn't. It doesn't. And guess what? When COVID-19 has run its course, as far as the politicians want us to feel, there'll be something else. There will always be something else. How do I know that? Remember anthrax? When everybody was scared to death to go to the post office? God forbid you get a package you didn't order. There's always going to be something. There's always going to be something to capture the fear and anxiety of the American people. That's not it. Let us be captured and let our attention be gazed on there's, there's something better. This is not it. This is not it. How do you know this isn't the best God has? Because your Bible says two things. Number one, heaven and earth will pass away. Heaven and earth will pass away. This earth, the Bible says, will be no more. And there's a new heaven and a new earth that God has prepared. A city built four square. E, 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 perf, perfectly square. Perfect, a perfect cube descending out and, and being a new place. That is gold streets, gates of pearl with jewels and all sorts of beautiful sights that we can't even imagine. And it's, it's not a bad thing when we pass away. It's not. It's not. Do you know why? Because the Bible says that the Lord rejoices in the death of his saints. Yeah, it is not that people have died. It's they've changed their address. There's something better coming. So as you leave this week and as you live life, I want to remind you of this eternal truth. No matter how bad it gets here, we have hope. We have hope. There's something better coming. Oh, brother, is there? I'm talking about a cheesecake the size of Texas. There's something better coming. There's something better coming. So I want to pray for you today because I don't want what's happening in the earth to take your hope away. Don't take your, but neither be so focused on that there is something waiting for you that you stop doing what you're called to do. Find the balance, amen? So would you stand all over the room? And would you lift your hands and would you just begin to pray? Father, I pray for an impartation of hope today that we will know beyond the shadow of every doubt that we are called and loved and anointed by you. We pray, God, that we would always remember this chief corner of our foundation that you have prepared a place for us, that where you are, we may be also. We are reminded today to hold our supernatural fork because something better is on the way. And Lord, we pray that every person that is here this morning would know that they know that they know that they are a prepared people. 
Not because they're good, not because of their manners, but because they're forgiven. And your blood has washed away every sin. And we give you praise for it in Jesus' name. With every head bowed and every eye closed, you put your hands down. I want to give you an opportunity today to know that you know that you know that Jesus is your Savior, your sins are forgiven, and that heaven is your home. You don't have to hope and pray that heaven will be your home. You will know beyond the shadow of every doubt that heaven is your home because he's washed your sins away. If that's you today and you would just simply say, Pastor Tim, please pray for me. I want, I want my sins to be forgiven. I want to know that I am redeemed by God. I want to know that there's nothing in my life to separate me from Him. And no matter how bad it may look, I have hope because heaven is waiting on me. If that's you, I'm going to count to three in a moment. When I say three, I just want you to raise your right hand. You're not committing anything other than to turn your life over to God. You're saying, here I am. I'm lost. I need a Savior. I don't want to think I'm going to heaven. I want to know that I'm going to heaven. When I receive Christ, I am so sure for heaven, it's as if I'm already there. When I say three, if that's you, raise your hand. One, two, three. Do it now all over this room. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Put your hands down. I'm going to ask you just for a simple step of faith. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to ask you to say anything in the microphone. But as a step of faith, to, to show God that you mean business, if you raised your hand, even if you didn't, and you want to say with me, Pastor Tim, I'm ready. I'm ready to turn my life over to God. I'm ready to know that heaven is my home. Would you step out from where you're seated and come and meet me at the front? My wife and I want to pray for you. Just do it now. You raised your hand, even if you didn't. You would say, this is my moment. This is my time. This is the time my life changes. In Jesus' name. Come on, church. Put your hands together and give God praise for this. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, if you've got a burden for any of these people, would you come stand behind them? Just as, just as a, a point to join your faith with theirs. Hallelujah. This, folks, is the greatest miracle God can do to take us out of darkness and into his light. The salvation of the soul. Hallelujah. Let's all lift our hands, everybody up front and in the back, and let's pray this prayer together. Heavenly Father, I come to you this morning, and I am ready for my life to be changed. I acknowledge I've made mistakes. I have failures and faults. But I believe that Jesus is God's Son, sent to this earth to die on the cross, to be resurrected again, and He is coming back. So I confess with my mouth, and I believe in my heart, that He is my Savior, He is my Lord, and the forgiver of my sin. And I know that as of this moment, I am born again. My sins are forgiven. And I am on my way to heaven because I am a prepared person. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Everybody, put your hands together and give God praise this morning. Hallelujah. 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 Isn't God good? Isn't God good? Amen. Come on, let's, uh, let's just love on these folks, if you will. And um, God's doing something. God's doing something. Heaven is waiting. Amen. Heaven is waiting. Heaven is waiting. Let's be clear about something. Heaven is not about the mansion. It's not about the mansion. It's not about what he's prepared. Heaven is about the God who's there. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. You can go back to your seats. I want you to do something for me as we continue this series. I want you to help me spread the word because I believe what God is going to be doing in the next month is bringing people to salvation. I believe it. I believe it. 
We have one more week of hope, and then we're going to the third cornerstone, which is love. Love. The love of God, the love that he gives us, the loves that we live by. I think this is something that our nation needs to hear. And so just get excited about what God's doing and go tell somebody. And if you notice somebody wasn't here today, call them this afternoon. Say, where were you? We missed you. We love you. Is there anything we can do for you? That's, a, that's the body being the body, reaching out and loving on people. Amen. And uh, I know God's got good things in store. I want to remind you, we close here in just a second, uh, that if you are part of that strategy team and you want to uh, be with us for that meeting, make your way immediately to uh, the fellowship hall. And uh, we're waiting on some pizza, and then we've got some things we just got to iron out. And, uh, and everybody, if you've not signed up yet, please sign up today. Do not leave this place. You are forbidden to leave this place <laughs> until you sign up. And, well, I, I don't know where. There will be somebody at the table that can help you out, and they will let you know. You just see Dana. She knows it all. <laughs> Amen. Amen. God's good. Amen. How many are thankful for what he's done this morning? Amen. Jerry, will you come? Well, it says all heaven rejoices with just one with just one Lord we thank you we thank you for salvation Lord we thank you for writing our names in your book of life we thank you for the joy of your salvation and Lord we rejoice in you Lord these words that we hear Lord they are strengthening us they are bringing life to us they are bringing hope to us and we rejoice and thank you for all of the blessings that have been brought forth through Jesus Christ. And we exalt you, Lord. And we thank you for the sealing of these words in our hearts, Lord. And helping us to remind ourselves of who you are in us and who we are in you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Hallelujah. Y'all be blessed today. Love on somebody. Hallelujah.